All right. So you've made it to 5 p.m. <laughs> I just saw a yawn. So just to make sure that we are all awake, give yourselves a round of applause for being here and alert at 5 p.m. on a Monday. Yay! <laughs> cool. So um, Nancy kind of got us thinking about this in her keynote earlier. But this panel is called Virtual Art in the Real World. And so what we're going to be talking about is what's happening in immersive art, how is it making its way into the real world in terms of um, economic models, in terms of types of art, in terms of you know, interventions and hacks. Um, and each of these creators is, is super talented in their own right. Um, and so, but there's, there is a lot of us and, and time is limited. So I'm going to ask you each to give you know, your like two, three sentence quick intro on who you are and uh, what your art practice is. Hi, I'm Marjolaine Mordem, and uh, I'm a digital artist and an animator, and just a quick thing, my first exhibited animation was in 1984 with the Commodore 64, <laughs> and so I have a long-standing computer and digital art practice, and in recent years, I'm known for the art hacks, hashtag art hacks that I do as interventions, mm -hmm. uh, which have gone viral on the internet, and, and I also do them as not transgressive, but actual commissioned and curated AR and we are for exhibition as well. Hi, I'm Carrie Abel. I'm a musician and visual artist and virtual reality painter. Um, and I just a couple months ago came out with my first uh, 360 VR painting music video for my single with ADM Records. So if you guys want to check it out, that's streaming in 360 on YouTube. Awesome. I'm Ken Perlin. I'm a professor uh, in, uh, at NYU, where I direct the Future Reality Lab. Um, most of my history has been focused on computer graphics and animation, and in recent years our lab has focused on social collaborative mixed reality, um, socially shared collaborative experiences with a focus though on people being in the same room. I'm Nancy Baker Cahill. I'm a multidisciplinary artist. I'm the founder of the Fourth Wall app. So I'm primarily a studio artist, a fine artist, but I also work, to, work in uh, VR and AR. And the app itself is a public art app that is accessible to anyone with an iPhone a, uh, or an Android phone of a certain generation, I'm sorry. Um, but we do, I, I both, the app both allows you to place my uh, VR drawings, which have been translated into AR, anywhere you want, anywhere in the world, and create your own context and content. And then there's also a platform for resistance and inclusive creative expression, which is a curated part of the app, and it's appeared all over the globe as well. Um, my name is Su Guan Chung. I'm an artist and researcher. I primarily explore this medium um, to investigate the sensory mixes of the future. Um, I think there's a lot of potential in reframing traditional mediums and processes like drawing in a 3D space, which is what I've done through residencies at uh, Google. Um, uh, I have a background as a researcher at Media Lab as well. So lately, my, my recent project is a uh, spatial audio driven um, mixed reality piece that premiered at Tribeca with, uh, with verse pictures and super bright. And what we did was we took over the whole space of Spring Studios and uh, created a, a series of six environments that um, responded to um, the, the input of the audience and uh, was a placed a spatial audio experience of Yo-Yo Ma's work. So that was the recent piece. Told you they're awesome. Um, so I want to start because a lot of people in the crowd might be more familiar with the tech side of things than the fine art world and the arts in general. So I want to kind of frame this first part of the conversation around, you all kind of touched on it with, with your intros. Um, with what your relationship with the fine art world in terms of bringing a digital practice or a sensory practice into that space has been. Um, Nancy, since you started us off earlier, I'll have you start us off again. So talk to me a little bit about um, the work you're doing in contrast to the fine arts world by way of public access and, and AR art. OK. Um, uh, let's see. I came to draw first in VR and then translate it into AR. Very, very honestly, naturally, it came out of a conceptual need to, to increase the empathic potential of the drawings that I was doing. I'm always trying to elicit an empathic response on the part of the viewer. So that's where I began 
was drawing, using my 2D drawings as inspiration for these 3D experiences, and I quickly learned that that was much less accessible to a broader audience, and which inspired me to create these site-specific, well, it's, yeah, in two parts, the very first iteration of the app to um, invite an unknown and unseen audience to experience public art on their own terms and to grant a different kind of access, a different kind of choice and agency in how they experienced fine art on their own terms. And by extension, that led to site-specific interventions, I like to call them idea activations, and these sort of shared thought spaces where I invited other artists who were working really rigorously and topically to place works of historic, cultural, or political importance to them. Thank you. And Marjan, you've been doing something um, sort of related to what she's talking about. Obviously, as you mentioned, I mean, 1984, talk about like a fateful tech year to like <laughs> get in with a Commodore. But, but so you've been doing something similar lately with kind of intervening at existing art events. Um, without spo I don't want to spoil anything, so I want to just kind of send <laughs> that over to you. Tell us a little bit about that and, and a little bit of the reasoning behind why you're doing what you're doing. Well, I, I had this like existing uh, digital art practice uh, in 3D animation with the figures that I do in my existing style, which you know I've also originated, and um, and I was exhibiting those as large scale uh, prints, animated paintings. I even did them as avatar painting with uh, audience driving the figures in my paintings with Kinect and Unreal Engine in 2015 at an art center. And so I, I had this sort of large body of work, but something that kept coming up is an awful lot of my work was actively engaged in a political, cultural, and social critical discourse. And so I constantly found myself in a situation where galleries didn't want to show the stuff that was very heavily critical of the economic injustice in our world. Mm -hmm. And then I had the public art centers that would show my work, and then they would nix the pieces that they couldn't show because of the sexual context, or the feminist dialogue, or, or there, was a, there was almost always something. And when you think about it, you know, I mean, we live in New York City, or I do anyways, and physical art exhibition is an incredibly expensive proposition here. I mean, a gallery has to spend a fortune on, on its rent. It has to pay all these people. If I have to deliver 10 large format printed, mounted prints, it's a fortune. So it's an expensive proposition. So artists are increasingly limited in terms of the kind of critical discourse that they can engage in. So starting in 2016 as a digital artist, my attitude was, you know, the whole purpose of the digital is that it can do all those things the physical can't. And that's when I came up with the idea of why don't I have the critical discourse that I want to have without censorship through self-exhibition using spatial computing, period. And that's exactly what I did. And so I started hacking my same chronometric sculpture figures and the same exact critical dialogue and discourse that footage shot and found exhibi exhibition footage on social media spaces. Um, and I, I, I immediately engaged in criticizing the over commodification and over financialization of the art world through the art fair process. And this was in 20, May of 2016. And as a testament, this was two years before Jerry Saltz wrote the article of, you know, let's end the art fair models. This was two years before Team Gallery said we're no longer going to exhibit an art fair. So back then, it still hadn't started. And I can tell you that a lot of my friends who would usually put likes on, you know, my art when I would post it to social media, they didn't put a single like on it. In the beginning, when I first started this, people were afraid that they would get into trouble. But then once the work, work, work got popular and went viral with millions of views, then of course now everybody loves it. <laughs> I just wanted to bring that up. In the beginning, it kind of felt like, oh my god, what are you doing? You can't quite do this. <laughs> mm -hmm. But to me, and, and, um, and just one other thing I wanted to say is an example of the power of the digital and spatial computing and, and, and the aesthetics of the digital in our world is not all of my uh, mixed reality hacks, hashtag art hacks, you can look them up, um, not all of them were about the over-financialization uh, of the art world. Some of them were art historic. For instance, in 2016, Gagosian did a 100-year survey of the nude in art. And so I hacked my non-binary nude glitch via my chronometric sculpture in that show because that comprehensive survey of the nude in art did not have a digital nude. It's the 21st century. There's no digital nude and no non-binary nude. So to me, that was the beauty of digital art. First of all, I could animate 
uh, figurative sculpture using the plasticity of the digital to show a figure having this physical choreographed dialogue with its own gender and how it pushes and pulls and plays with itself, which you can't do with static analog physical sculpture. This absolutely requires the plasticity of the digital. But I could also do this art historic intervention. And um, to me, this is the power of the digital. Not that, oh, here's the latest fancy VR and AR technology. That to me is, well, there's always going to be new technology. There's been new technology since caveman era art. But it's what is inherent to the technology. And it's egalitarian, democratizing, and interventionist nature. And it's intangibility, immateriality, the fact that it's not bound by the rules of the physical. And as such, these are the technologies of the human imagination. And we're externalizing and aggregating this collectively sourced imagination through this technology. And that's why the 21st century is about uh, the imagination economy to a large extent. So to me, that, that kind of blew up this work. And from there, I've done chronometric sculpture, AR activations for our own museum in Germany, the Smithsonian last year. They're going to be showing that piece again this year, and also for pieces that I'm exhibiting in galleries. So yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. I feel like there's a few moments there where they're like, mic drop. Ah, sorry. I just no, no, that's great. <laughs> try that's to get great. a lot of stuff in. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really incredible. <laughs> and moving from. Um, the sort of macro political to more of the micro political, the way that you know we talk about all art being political. Suguin, and picking up some of what you said about the new technology and what's really at the heart of what we're able to share, um, you have one of the most diverse practices that I see of any new media artist. And yet what holds it all together is it's all about gesture and all about using 3D space and new technologies to, to, to redefine and sort of reshape what gesture is and what it means. Um, so I'd love to hear kind of the thoughts behind what's kind of animated you to like work with robots to help draw your paintings or you know, create tilt brush drawings for, for 360 art. Like, Just yeah, give us a little bit of sense of what draws all that together. Sure, I, I wasn't sure if I was going to talk about the robot projects today. But um, so another body of my work is focused on human and robotic collaboration. I do performances with multiple robotic units um, as a way of almost like physicalizing and embodying the data uh, and embodying the drivers that um, you know, uh, define the behavior of a robotic unit. Um, and, I, and I do that because I think there's a lot of um, potential in demonstrating the, um, the fallibility of both human and machine systems in the space of performance. Um, in that realm, too, what interests me about gesture in both robotic collaboration and performance and VR is that, you know, it's, it's a way of sort of thinking through space and bringing the body back into some of the conversations we have about technology um, that's been really inspiring for me. And, and I think, you know, there's, and I'm sure we can all agree that when working with new technologies, it's really easy to get lost in the mix and like, uh, uh, you sort of forget to trust your intuition in a certain way because the interface of the application wants you to do a certain thing. Um, and for me, bringing gesture and drawing back into it is almost like a control. Like it's a way of making sure that I have authenticity within the tool that I'm using, and um, and and that's really been one of the primary drivers. So. Amazing. And kind of carrying that thread, um, Carrie, you your work is predominantly as a musician, and then you came to immersive art, and I found a way to kind of embody your music in gesture through immersive art. So what have you found in your experience of actually sort of, I don't want to say recreating, but re-embodying your music as a, as a felt, lived, artistic experience? And what have you seen some of the reactions being to that, that process when you show it? Oh, sure. Um, well, so I, I predominantly started as a, a visual artist. And I don't think you actually know this. I have only been writing songs for three years. So oh, OK, wow. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. That kind of took off unexpectedly Gotta as go. well. Um, and uh, but I think that what has been really interesting about um, being in this um, XR world is that people are not so um, entranced by forcing you to choose like, oh, you're an artist or oh, you're a musician. It kind of makes sense. And then I also think that um, doing uh, more avant-garde music lends itself to having a really strong experience in visual. And I felt that um, when people are experiencing like the, the um, sound response of VR music video that's also you know, my um, sculpture and painting, it, uh, it's almost easier for them to process um, new sounds and like a more experimental music. Um, 
And then I also think, uh, so some of my really good friends have told me that it's like stepping into your brain. So it's a really exciting for me to find a way to really, um, yeah, like explore all of these different um, facets of me that seem so connected in mm -hmm. a really um, authentic way. And it's also like, to go back to what you were talking about earlier, it's really accessible, it's more accessible. Like if there's a, a painting, I think one of the things that draws me to music and to VR is that it's, um, you know, you can put up a 360 video on YouTube that everybody can see and like a paint, like a physical painting people might not ever see in mm. person. Like they'll see the image, but it's not really a piece. So mm. I don't know if that answers your Yeah, question. absolutely. Speaking of stepping into brains, um, and by the way, everybody, um, up here behind us, we have sort of different representative pieces from each of the artists, but of course, there's tons, tons, tons more to see. Um, the one I picked uh, for Ken is, uh, is it called Dia de los Halos? Is that, is that how we, is that yeah. the title? Um, and if you actually watch his keynote at Games for Change last year, you can actually see the ways in which people are actually embodying these different skeletons and playing music together. So I want to kind of lead in with you uh, in terms of thinking about co-presence as a way of, of shared artistic experience. What has been your experience in kind of facilitating that, watching how people respond to immersion? I know that you really want the kind of discussion to be around extended reality rather than calling it virtual necessarily as a way of drawing the, the real of reality into the virtual. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about the, that thinking. Okay, first of all, the, um, the artist that I work with, David Loebser, who's right there for making that piece and many other pieces. So, yay, yay, David. Oh, I know David. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, so, yeah, it's funny because it goes both ways. You get virtual art in the real world, real art in the virtual world. What are we doing? You know, I don't know. It could be either way. I feel as though um, a lot of, you were talking about distribution. Um, you know, only a certain number of people see a painting, but everybody sees um, um, something that you put out there in cyberspace. Um, it's, we do what we do, and then the world reacts to it in funny ways. And there's this dialogue that we're not completely in control of. So, for example, uh, last year, we showed an animated virtual theater piece for a co-located audience of 30 people, and we showed it... Um, at the SIGGRAPH conference. So I guess officially that made it a tech demo because it was at the SIGGRAPH computer graphics conference. We did exactly the same thing at the Tribeca Film Festival, and now it's art. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's got an IMDP page and all this stuff. <laughs> and so, so I feel as though I, my sense of what we're doing is we just have to keep doing what we're doing, um, just, you know, as, as Ian Forster said, only connect. Put people together, give them experiences, watch what they do, how people interact. I think what you were talking about, the importance of gesture, and discover from people what gestures they adopt. One of the early things we found out five years ago is that if you put two people who know each other into a physical space and they see each other as virtual avatars, they don't have to look like themselves at all they immediately identify that person as my friend and mm. they just keep their conversation going. Mm. There, there's, there's ideas of identity and embodiment that are not about the specifics of visual representation, but I think are about the ideas of trust that you get when you're physically in the same space with someone. Mm. And I think we're just beginning to understand those trust issues, and I think they go way, way back to long, long before we had modern technology. Mm. But that's, that's why we're very excited about putting people in the same physical room, because I think there's a level of collaboration, connection, emotional engagement, and therefore possibilities of creation that happen when you engage the trust card that can only <laughs> actually be engaged when people are physically together. And there's the danger that they might touch each other. Mm. So that's why we do what we do. Amazing. So I want to go to a, a broader question sort of for all of you to, to you know, kind of popcorn with. Um, but with this new, you know, I guess as a, as a first statement, does anybody think that this is not a new artistic paradigm? Because I know you referenced the, some of these are sort of ancient, ancient practices. Is this a new paradigm? Is this the summation of, of existing paradigms? Like wh where do we stand on that before I kind of go to the next, next question? Um, you know, I, I, I brought up earlier that I look at these as the technologies of the imagination. 
And the, you know, on some levels, the story of art is the story of human imagination. I mean, we have the physical world, and then we have the imagined world. You know, and all of us sort of cohabit that. And now we got a third world, which is the phone in our hand, right? <laughs> so we're habituated to kind of like straddling the line between reality and the imagined. And we now have these technologies that are externalizing and allowing for the aggregation, a mm. collective sourcing of a type of imagination. Mm. And if you look at the popularity, for instance, of a series, a stream series, web series, I mean, look at the Russian doll or the AO. These are both highly imaginative tales. It's the nature of this century. It's the nature of this world. You know, the last three months, I've been doing an artist in residency with Adobe Project Arrow. And so I've been having a lot of fun building these, you know, elaborate spatial AR constructs. And Ken, it's really true. Like as I'm going through doorway, I literally dip down. It's a phone. Yeah. It's not even a headset. <laughs> and everybody I test, they do the same thing. They dip down. <laughs> and, and all I've been doing is creating spaces and spaces and spaces and drosties. And it's like the nature of the technology. It pulls that imagination out of us. So it's like before we know it, we're creating imagined worlds and then imagined worlds in there and then imagined worlds in there. <laughs> to some extent, it's the iterative nature of the digital. Mm. And to some extent, it's the nature of us as human beings that we want to play and imagine. The physical reality has never been enough for us. If it had, we'd never have art <laughs> or entertainment or literature or music that we crave imagined worlds. Mm. And here we are with technology that's like human imagination on steroids. You know, that's pretty much it. Mm. <laughs> I, would say, I think, um, I definitely think it's a new, a new medium and like a new forefront of a, a new medium. Um, because when I first started doing Tilt Brush about a year and a half ago, um, I think I had this uh, light bulb moment when I started thinking about it as drawing sculpture instead of painting because, um, it, I was frustrated that I couldn't like blend or like do more things like that. And so I think once I realized that, okay, there, but I can't paint with light when I'm painting, you know, like, so there's like <clears throat> the, in the same way that, you know, charcoal is totally different than oil painting. It's the same thing as VR painting is a completely different medium that has its limitations and benefits that you just have to, you know, play with and get used to. Mm. Yeah, I don't think we should oversell it. I mean, um, I love reading novels, and I love watching movies, and I love going to live theater, and not one of those things can compete with any of the others. Mm -hmm. I think it's wonderful that we have this exciting new medium, but we should remember, it, we're gonna learn this medium like we gradually learn those others, and it's going to be phenomenal, but it's mm -hmm. not going to take over and replace. It's, mm -hmm. it's gonna be a yes and situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would build on, on that and just say that I'm really excited about what it unleashes in individuals. And I think because, particularly because there's no environmental impact to this medium, it allows us to be, it gives us a different kind of freedom and allows us to be subversive, not to ask permission, but also invites a, an entirely, like Marjan was saying, like an entirely different type of imagination and conceptualization of art in space, art on site, and what those conversations might reveal. So I think that's what's super exciting to me about it, um, you know, uh, is just that, that kind of potential that, mm. that it's unlocking in individuals. Um, to that point, I think, I like that we're all going in a yeah. row. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I've, I've always thought, because I, I grew up um, making digital work, like, you know, of that generation, and, you know, I always thought about the screen as a space of fantasy, um, where our fantasies are realized. Um, uh, Andre Neuselder, a Dutch uh, philosopher and media theorist, writes a lot about it. Um, and that was sort of one of these seminal books that it just made so much sense to me. And I think one thing when I started working in uh, VR and mixed reality that um, I read that really resonated with me as well is that um, it's, it's different from a screen in the way that inhabiting uh, VR in particular is inhabiting not only place, but the experience of it is actually creating a memory because there's no removal, there's no, um, there's no embodied distance of looking at a screen. I thought that was really powerful in terms of uh, showing process, you know, and, and uh, manipulating time uh, through, through that medium in a way that is actually implanting memories into someone's brain. And that's really, really powerful. And I think there are ways that that can be um, a little bit dystopian, depending on what kind of gaming experience you're doing, but also incredibly exciting uh, in terms of translating my ideas as an artist to 
um, an audience. So, yeah. Can I just add one thing to Please. that? Because that just <laughs> triggered something in me. Um, I think it's also the opportunity is to really engage the unconscious in new ways Absolutely. that we haven't before, um, both in VR but also in AR. And when I was speaking this morning, one of the things I said, which I really hold true, is that once you start geolocating artworks in, in space, because you can't see them with the naked eye, because you need that prosthesis, you need that visual, that, uh, you know, visual prosthesis, once you know they're there, they occupy this kind of ghost space. So they continue to act on you, they continue to work on you, and their content continues to work on you. Cool. And I think that that's a really, really special, like, weirdly, memory activation. Yeah. Like, it's a kind of new <clears throat> thing and new way of applying it. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And how are you as artists thinking about, I mean, this is a question, this is like one of those MFA art school questions that you hate, but of course, like, it is sort of relevant to what we're doing, but I'm curious how you think through your audience, because traditionally speaking, in the, like, let's call it the 20th century sort of paradigm, over time you were taught, like, don't think about your audience, make your art on its own terms, and just leave it to exist, and then people will engage with it, read a response, they'll just sort of create their own ideas. But with a lot of this work, you're actually having to think about UX and UI. You're actually having to think, like, how does somebody physically engage with this work? So I'm just curious, like, how are each of you thinking about and it doesn't have to go on a line again, by the way. Unless, Marjan, you want to go first, but like. I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because you brought that up. Like, historically speaking, I mean, first of all, I always like it when artists say, oh, I don't care about what other people think. I'm like, yeah, you don't care, but your ego does. <laughs> I mean, almost every artist I know anguishes over that, right? <laughs> what people said at the opening. But the interesting part of exhibiting on the net and net art is that, you know, you, you hear tens of thousands of comments. And, and it's like such a totally different experience. And to make matters worse, you have all the metrics. So you have to click on the button that says view insight. And then next thing you know, you have like this amazing wealth of information that's analytics and, and the metrics. And I sometimes wonder, artists never had access to this kind of information before. You know, it's like 50 people you talk to at an opening is one thing. But, you know, 64,000 shares and 3.6 million views and I don't know how many comments and all the metrics of that is like a completely different experience. Has it affected me? Absolutely. Mm. But I'll tell you amazing things that happen too in exhibition. And um, like for instance, I, uh, you know, when I did the glitch goddess and she glitches the idea that a woman can be a singular form. So she switches from fat to skinny to young to old to, you know, um, stylized and abstract. And you know, that went viral and then I had to do a print that's currently on exhibit at 836M Gallery in San Francisco. And, and, the AR activation on AI's platform, that's the, the app, and she literally steps out of the painting and starts to walk around and go through her transformations. And the voiceover, for the voiceover, I literally took comments from the comments that the women had made yeah. on my post of the Glitch Goddess, talking about their bodies and inequality. So the voiceover is actually the voice of women on the internet responding to my work, exactly. Wow, Talk about the Russian nested doll effect of the internet and technology that I was mentioning before. And the weird part is that that was exhibited in San Francisco and women loved it. I mean, they were just looking at her and listening to her and this one woman came up to me at the opening and she said, you know, I always look at art and I wonder what's going through the artist's mind. <laughs> she said, you're showing me and telling me what's going through the artist's mind with this AR app. So I thought that was interesting. And one other quick thing that happened on exhibition, and this is what I love about the interactive nature of exhibiting digital art. I have a chronometric sculpture figure called Svarin, uh, immunologicist, that's loosely based on uh, contemporary German philosopher Peter Sloterdijk's Bubbles trilogy. And he's, his animation, his chronometric sculpture is he's in this state of constant identitarian reaction. Like that's us on Twitter, basically. <laughs> and so he's constantly freaking out and reacting and recovering, freaking out and uh, recovering. And so when I was exhibiting him last fall in Enamored Armory, an exhibition of three women artists at Rowan University, and so he was on a print activation on a turntable so people could look at him as sculpture in the round. <laughs> um, and this, and I have this video on my social media. This guy out of nowhere came and he called me and said, can I show you something? And I'm like, yeah. And he put his hand behind the AR figure and he said, come here, little cutie. I will take care of you. And it's like the video's on the internet. You can watch him do this whole speech. And he's like extending care and nurturing to this freaked out figure that's like 
an augmented reality animation. Take a moment to consider that. And I just loved what he did. He immediately responded with compassion mm -hmm. and understanding. And that, to me, is amazing when that happens. You talk about how people play with this stuff imaginatively on their own. So like we put this technology out, and then there's a wave that comes back mm -hmm. of what people do with it. And that's the case with all spatial computing, mm -hmm. you know, VR, AR, all of it. And that, to me, is the really fascinating part, that there's an audience component to every piece of uh, spatial computing art there is, regardless of the particular form that it takes, mm. that the people are a part of the art. And they're going to bring something to it that I didn't anticipate. Mm. I guess we're going down the line. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I guess um, for me, uh, primarily as a, a painter and a musician, I, I, I would have to say I don't really think about the audience very much. I think very much about it's, it's all um, I, it's all internal, and it's um, to be honest, I would I would probably be dead if I didn't create something every day. <laughs> so I think um, I think that it's you know through self. Um, sort of uh, soothing and that, that I think sometimes the best art is created and that hopefully um, through that process for myself it, it um, helps other people and touches other people. But um, through, through VR and getting more into the, um, that side of things was really the first time that I did start thinking about the audience. And um, I think it was when I was doing uh, my first uh, VR painting for um, a show at uh, Volta during Armory Week last year. And um, at my residency, they were really trying to get me to create something. They were like, no, but you got to make a tiny little poem and hide it for people to find. And I was like, this is an art show. Like, this is going to be the first time anyone has seen anything like this that, that's at this show. These aren't going to be like people that are familiar. It's going to be the first time putting on the headset. So I'm not giving them you know, controllers. It's just going to be them like immersed in the painting. And, and I was totally right, because the people that came, I mean, there were actually, there were actually some viewers that they put the headset on and just stood there and they said, nothing's moving. And I was like, you have to move. <laughs> and, and so it, I think, you know, they thought it was gonna be like a video or something. So I think just thinking about like the kind of audience that's gonna be seeing it and, you know, is it gonna be people that are totally familiar with XR or is it gonna be people that have literally never seen it before and might be a little uncomfortable about putting on a headset or, so, yeah. Well, I think there are two questions embedded in your question and it's useful to tease them out. Um, so, Roughly speaking, a difference between entertainment and art to a first approximation is entertainment gives people answers and art gives people questions. <laughs> um, but the fact that people are walking away with questions because your work provoked them to think outside of the way they didn't think before is not the same as confusing them. Mm -hmm. So I think when there's a new medium, sometimes people, you can't really provoke people to get outside of their comfort zone effectively if you're not in control of your medium. So for example, to what you said, if you give people controllers, they're gonna expect to do something with those controllers. And it's not an honest interaction to say, here's some controllers, there's nothing for you to do, <laughs> for example. Um, and I, I think it goes back through history. I mean, you know, you study art just a little and you realize that Picasso was an incredible draftsman. Mm -hmm. He knew exactly what he was doing. So, and then he was leading people away from realism, but he was doing it knowing exactly who he was leading them every step of the way. So I think in a new medium, such as the one we're working in, virtual reality, extended reality, mixed reality, we need to understand these new tools and be very in control of them, especially if we want to provoke people and bring them out of their comfort zones. I would answer I, maybe slightly differently because so much of my work recently has been so collaborative with, with people I don't know, with, un, with an unknown, untested audience. Um, I've learned really to take a leap of faith and trust in other people's imagination and ingenuity because I've been really blown away by what happens when you offer raw materials, when you offer a drawing to someone and say, here, do, do what you want with it. Um, I've been astonished. So there's that piece to, to audience engagement. And the other thing, which I, I hate to repeat what I said this morning, but it does answer your question to some degree, is like 
this piece of Desert X, this monumental piece that I, I made a couple of pieces for this biennial in the Coachella Valley. And oftentimes people would show up to experience the work, which obviously you can't see with the naked eye, and wouldn't have the, the, the technology they needed or they wouldn't understand necessarily, maybe I need to redesign my UI, um, how to use it. But somebody on site always did. And so this, these magical, unexpected, and impromptu communities sprang up. And people would have conversations around you know, the, the conceptual, what the conceptual aims of the work were, what the content was of, the, of the artwork was. And then they would engage with it themselves in, on their own terms, and then share their pictures, their videos, whatever. And back to Marjan's point, you know, the, the, the role that social media plays in all of this cannot be underestimated in terms of a kind of shared collective experience and also as a kind of public archive of these experiences <coughs> and of the ways in which people are choosing to interact with the work. So to me, I think of the audience I think of an audience, you know, I want to connect with my audience always, but I really think of it as an invitation to conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, here's, here's what I am offering you. What, what do you have to say back? And I'm always interested in the answer. Mm -hmm. um, that resonates with me a lot, actually, thinking about the conversation that happens around the work. Um, I do a lot of performance artwork, but I, I can't say that I'm thinking about the audience when, when I'm, you know, doing my... Uh, performances with the robotic work, but I do think um, often about the zeitgeist around technology, uh, whether that's AI or mixed reality or whatnot, and I think there's so much um, around the work uh, and, and around the conversations we have about these emerging technologies that address the promises, possibilities, and paranoias of, of these new tools, right? And I think a lot of the time I'm trying to investigate and interrogate what those promises and paranoias might be which is why it's kind of schizophrenic what I end up doing. Like, I, I work in all these different mediums, but I think that's very much what, um, what drives my practice and, and, and what I think the work we're doing is, is about. So. Amazing. So going away from now the kind of, like, the, the seed of art and, and practice and going to how do you make a life doing this stuff, Let's, let's, let's talk about this kind of elephant in the room of what are distribution models, what are economic models, what, what's, the, what's the gallery models, what are the museum models, what are the festival models, how are you getting your art out in the world? And Marjan, you're not allowed to start this time so that we don't end up in a thing, but we definitely want to hear from you on this. So <laughs> what are you for? Okay. Are we starting with me? Oh, um, <laughs> uh, models for making this work possible. I think I've really been lucky. I've worked with the residency model quite a lot, where I get to collaborate with amazing engineers and amazing fabricators to, to really bring um, not only my process into uh, the work, but also the conversation around what's possible with technologies. Um, I did a residency with Google uh, Tilt Brush uh, and sort of got to know the team really well. And they built tools for me that um, we ended up open sourcing. So I thought that was a really cool way of contributing to um, the creative like landscape at large while also engaging different types of collaborators, which is kind of my thing, actually, mm -hmm. human and non-human. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's been really wonderful. I think uh, speaking about the work has been an interesting um, uh, model for not only getting it out there, um, but uh, financing, you know. Uh, and, and yeah, it's, I, I would say that that's, and I don't know how you guys feel about it, but that's as sometimes trying to find ways to make the work happen is almost like an art form in and of itself. Yes. It always sort of comes together in different ways, and, uh, and that's uh, part of the, the fun, I suppose, but yeah. I would say it's also a full-time job. <laughs> yeah, it's great, yeah. Yeah, I mean, for me, I was fortunate enough in, to have initial investors in my app, which is a free app, and it, and it was really crucial to me that it remained free as a public art app. And fortunately, through things like Desert X, this biennial has had enormous exposure, people sharing it on social media. Again, that's been one way of very naturally distri distributing the content and the ideas behind it. But it is a huge struggle. I mean, I've had certain AR artworks commissioned, which, you know, that's, that's exciting. But honestly, I support my practice with my 2D work, with my studio, with the work I do in the studio. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and I'm lucky to have tech partners, but it's expensive to work with them. And um, so it remains a huge challenge, at least for me. I don't teach. It's, and I'm so impatient that when I want to do something, I just do it. And then I pick up the pieces afterwards. But um, 
Yeah, that's that, that's my model. <laughs> Don't ask permission; just ask for forgiveness. I, I think that the what happens with any medium is actually it's really about distribution. Um, you know, the late 1800s uh, paperback books, and then the early 20th century, the affordable, cheap camera, and then the 60s, the transistor radio, and then you know we go skip forward YouTube. Um, I think we're just this moment with. I guess with the Oculus Quest, entering the moment when creators will start jumping in by much larger numbers and start saying, I'm going to create for this because I can have a large audience and get high quality results. Mm -hmm. I think we're just, this year is when that's starting and we're gonna get a huge increase in the number of young people who are gonna choose to use this as a creative medium, which is very exciting. <laughs> um, so I kind of second what, uh, Nancy was saying about um, as a 2D artist, I um, definitely that's how I support myself. Uh, but uh, with I'm really fortunate with the XR and VR to um, work with the guys that jump into the light, where I get to come in and, and create all these things, and I learn something new every time I'm there. Um, and they actually, with the same conversation uh, I've been talking with them about, that um, they had the idea to for me to start working more with the Oculus uh, medium and doing sculptures and then having there be a physical element um, that people can have instead of, because it is very difficult to, people like having the experience, but I think it's more likely that people will be interested in you know, having the VR experience and then collecting like a physical um, object that was in the piece. So mm -hmm. um, I just um, started working with uh, Make Lab in New York City and I showed them backstage. Yeah, oh yeah, it's this one right here. They did, a, a, it's an amazing job, it's in, um, resin and you can see like all of the little details and it's the exact size that I was imagining so I'm super excited to be working with them but I think there's a lot of promise in that and just thinking about the physical it's also the same thing I think with um, with music we're having the same issue with music I mean there's just people don't make money unless it's um, you know like from ticket sales or from like merchandise and so at my um, single release I actually had hand painted um, ca cassette tapes and so like those did really well, but yeah, like it's, it's just, it's really interesting. It's a very similar issue with the XR world as with the music world, I think because of the digital mm. era, you know, so. Well, I've, I've had a long history and a long <laughs> practice. So, um, you know, I mean, starting in the eighties, I was working in production studios as an animator. And, uh, you know, I, so I, I was straddling both fine arts and applied arts and, and and, and you know, in the 90s, in the early 90s, I had a studio with two partners, Digital Media Arts Inc. on Fifth Avenue and 18th Street. And you know, we worked on top production accounts of that era. And I could tell you that there was no way I could be an individual, I could do my art without having the resources of a studio. I mean, just rendering animation back then, Ken remembers, <laughs> you know, it took, you know how much, an, you remember SGI workstations in the of course. Coast? I mean, it's, it was like insane. You had to be like ridiculously wealthy. So I was completely dependent mm. on commercial production for two things, access to technology and the skills. And I think that's like another big problem that people, and, and I always try to tell this to my students that, you know, learning the program today is meaningless because you're gonna have to learn a lot. And, and just doing the most superficial work with the new technology is also meaningless because we live in a hungry world where highly skilled people are competing with each other. So my, I always say find, develop an art practice that supplies you two things, the tools that you need, the technology and the skills. And the, and, the, and the continued learning. For me, commercial production fed my art practice and what I was exhibiting. And then at some point in the late 90s, I went into academia and became a college professor. And so I have what is called quote unquote institutional patronage as a tenured full college professor. So, which allows me to do my work with intellectual, political, aesthetic, and artistic freedom. And I'm probably, the, I could potentially be one of the last generations of artists that gets something called tenure, as everybody sadly yeah. knows, because of the changes that are happening. And it breaks my heart, because there's a part of me that says, I wanna see the young, I wanna see all the young ladies on this panel, <laughs> I wanna see all of you receive that kind of in, in, you know, institutional patronage, so that you can continue to have 
the same kind of art practice that I've had, but we live in a very different world. I can't make a living off my art, even though I get paid for my digital art, I have collectors, I have wealthy, well-known collectors, but I can't make, a, I can't pay the rent. If you look at my electric bills for my GPU render farm yeah. at home, I routinely, okay, get letters from Con Ed telling me I'm using too much electricity. I mean, I put Bitcoin miners to shame with my GPUs going 24-7 rendering. So it's an expensive <laughs> practice that I have. And I still have to occasionally do, every once in a blue moon, I do production jobs to get a new workstation, to get more GPUs, to get, I, I'm now thinking of buying a resin printer. <laughs> you know, I'm looking at the prices and going, I better do a gig to get the money. So it, it is, it's like this, it's a hustle. Uh, you know, having um, multi-decade digital art practice is a hustle. And I've, I mean, even when you have a full-time job like me, I still have to hustle to get the latest workstation, to get the multiple GPUs that I need, to get this, to get that. So, and, and, it's, and, and I always hear from artists that work with traditional media, say, oh, well, we have our expenses. And I don't mean to dismiss that, but they have their expenses for making the art. I have the expenses for digitally making the art first, which is all the tools. Yeah. Then I have to pay for the physical. <laughs> you know, which is a whole other cost. So we're like almost double the cost. Mm. I just wanted to bring that up. Sure. So the strategies that artists need to have is it's like we have to figure out new ways of monetizing. Nancy's nodding her head yeah. because that's the reality. 100%. It's, it is a tough, tough art practice to have. That's the truth. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to make time for one question. Unfortunately, uh, we had a lot of great ideas, but didn't leave a lot of time for questions. They will be here after the panel, obviously, so, so feel free to ask them uh, directly in person, but um, if anybody has, has one question to round us out. It's also hard to see with the light in my eyes. I think they understood everything. They said everything they needed to say. Thank you all so much. Thank, Thank you. you.